So we have, uh, yeah, just a quick round of uh, intros. Can you tell about yourselves? Yeah, so I will maybe start. <laughs> so my name is Rafał Biegać. I'm engineering manager uh, working on Airflow. Uh, uh, for uh, already four years. Um, I'm part of Google and we are delivering uh, Airflow as a service and the, the name of the of this product is Cloud Composer. Um, yeah, so I'm based in Poland uh, in Europe. As Jarek mentioned, we are, all of us actually, are part of the organizing committee for the uh, conference. Uh, by the way, Jarek uh, mentioned that we are representing uh, uh, major uh, providers of the Airflow uh, services. On the other hand, Jarek is Airflow PMC member, so he is representing the, the community. Uh, so I'm really uh, like uh, happy that we are going to have this panel because during the meetings for Airflow Summit organization, we were kind of different uh, dimension of discussions, and now we will be talking about our users. Over to you, Viras. Awesome. Uh, thank you all so much for having me up here. I feel really honored. Um, I'm Viraj. I'm one of the co-founders of Astronomer. I do a bunch of things there, uh, all of which lets me uh, talk to a lot of Airflow users and engage with the community. Um, it's been really fun planning the summit with all the people on the stage. Um, and I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, so if you ever want to talk about Airflow in New York, uh, come find us. Thank you. And I'm uh, John Jackson. I'm the principal product manager responsible for Amazon Managed Workflows for Apache Airflow, or MWAA, or Wahahaha, as some people call it. Um, <laughs> Uh, really, it was, it were, you know, I'm, I'm really representing a fantastic team that's that's behind that really, you know, manages that service and also, uh, you know, contributes back to the Airflow community. Uh, and it's really our pleasure and privilege to be able to help bring this summit, help organize it, and work with uh, work with my colleagues um, uh, that also help deliver Airflow to everyone in this room. Uh, and it's great. And I look forward to meeting more of you and, and hearing some of the great uh, great things we have to say today and for the rest of the day. So. Why do we have this panel, first of all, uh, the explanation? So uh, for me personally, as a maintainer, I, I get to hear the users uh, from the issues and from, from what they tell us when, they, when something is wrong, but that's very limited knowledge uh, because I have, we have access all, only to those people who are actually, uh, well, having problems. We don't talk to the users directly who just use Airflow. Uh, and are happy with that. Hopefully there are so many, many, many such users that I have simply no chance to, to talk to. And for me, this is the, the great opportunity to hear from, uh, from those people who have access to the users more directly. And I think the, the three gentlemen here have, uh, have, have access to, to the users and talk to them much more often. Also in situations when uh, there are not only problems, but also when there are some opportunities and, and new things uh, that user um, requests or want from Airflow. So my first question is like, how, how does it, how your job, uh, because like the, the thing is like the, the, those three gentlemen have completely different jobs. Uh, and uh, uh, my question is like how your job allows you to uh, tap into the uh, user's information, user's request, and uh, how, you, how it makes it possible uh, for you uh, uh, and how, uh, how you get the information from the users in your job. How, how does it work? So maybe I will start. So as engineering manager uh, and while delivering, uh, del delivering uh, Airflow in the form of Cloud Composer, I mostly meet on a daily basis uh, users who are not actually uh, Airflow de developers. They are not developing features for Airflow. They are uh, really end users of Airflow. Uh, and while using this Airflow, they are providing feed feedback uh, uh, to, to us, either uh, in the form of feature requests uh, or uh, asking for best practices, for example, how to improve the, um, uh, improve the user workload isolation. They, want, do, they have a lot of users using the same Airflow instance and how to uh, have proper security uh, routines in, in place. Uh, they, of course, come to us with some problems, uh, either uh, like they are reporting bugs uh, uh, in Airflow or Airflow providers because uh, we have like two kind of a little bit distinct uh, domains like Airflow core features and Airflow uh, providers. Um, and they many times ask for guidance how to uh, optimize Airflow to 
for better performance or to avoid problems to get more reliable work workloads. So, uh, and we get the feedback in the form of uh, meetings, ad hoc or uh, recurring, uh, uh, regularly uh, having like weekly meetings with customers. We help with uh, migrations um, uh, to, to Cloud Composer, for example, from self-managed uh, uh, airflows. Uh, we have discussion groups, uh, Slack, uh, and we have finally also support cases that we need to uh, help to resolve. Yeah, you know, I feel like uh, talking to users is basically my job at some point, so <laughs> there's a lot of ways I like to do that. Um, on one hand, uh, Astronomer does a lot of things around like meetups and just throwing airflow meetups. And um, as great as it is to live in like a virtually connected world, uh, there's really no substitute for just meeting somebody in person and asking them about their experience. Um, so I get a lot of really cool anecdotes that way. Um, I talk to the Airflow team internally a lot. Uh, thankfully, Astronomer has a lot of people a lot smarter than me working on Airflow. So it's really good to learn from them and see what they're seeing. Um, and we produce a lot of content that we um, engage our users in. Uh, so Kenton on our team does a ton of webinars. Everyone knows Mark. And just talking to them is like reading a dictionary of what users want. Uh, so I feel like I have uh, all the, like a bunch of great perspectives there. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting is just looking at some of the data. Um, so we keep a lot of dashboards about what features are people using in Airflow based on, uh, based on what we see on our platform um, or what versions are being downloaded and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of trends you can see around what people are doing just based on the data you have and it's really nice to augment that with some of the anecdotes that you get from just creating personal connections. And from my perspective, you know, really as a product manager, um, it's a partnership with engineering team, uh, and really the product manager is supposed to be the voice of the user. You know, we should uh, be able to represent the users to the engineering team and really guide what is done uh, both in the open source and as far as delivering the service. And the only way I can be the voice of the user is to talk to a whole bunch of them. And so we, long before we launched the service, I spoke with many, many Airflow users uh, or potential Airflow users to hear what do you need? What do you have to do? And then, of course, after that, there's even more users, and you have to speak. And sometimes, you know, you're 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 learning new things they want to do, or exploring how Airflow can best help them. And really, that's one of the best parts of the job is just being able to go and see all the really creative stuff. Uh, and then, often, I'll take that creative stuff and go and say, "Well, wonder if I can do that." So I'll spin up an Airflow cluster and I'll see if that works. And oh, they came up with something really cool, and I'll test it out against some stuff. So um, really, that's that's a, a, a big part of where I get the the data from to sort of validate how those customers were using it, and uh, you know what's what's possible to do beyond that. John, do you mind if I ask a follow-up question on that? Sure. So when you all were thinking about launching your service, you were obviously talking to people on AWS using Airflow in some capacity. Like, what were what made it so people wanted you all to launch a managed Airflow service? Were they all using Airflow? Were they using other orchestrators? I know there's a bunch of different scheduling tools within the Amazon ecosystem. Like, what was that whole process like? It's a great question. So, you know, really, we obviously, when you're launching something, you can't just tell everybody you're going to do it necessarily. So we had to tell, we were sort of limited to folks that had sort of NDAs in place. But um, yeah, we really talked to folks that either were already using Airflow and just they wanted to expand their usage, but managing themselves was getting to be burdensome. The operational, just just keeping things running was hard. Um, but other folks that were just, you know, listen, we really want our, our, our organization to adopt Airflow, but we're a little worried about having to stand up this project on our own. And, you know, we'd really like if you guys could just go ahead and offer something for us so we can take advantage of Airflow without having to learn all the underlying operational uh, uh, things, which is very much what, you know, I think all of us at, the, at this, uh, this um, um, t uh, uh, stage here are, are doing for our users as well. Yeah. Maybe one, th one uh, thing to, to add, like when uh, users are coming to, to, for example, public clouds, uh, and uh, other other platforms like orchestration is something that is uh, not an option like uh, it's al almost like obvious that people are going to need uh, some kind of orchestration and they are they have plenty of options like this workflow pattern is very very popular uh, like it, probably there is more than 100 uh, workflow technologies out there and each platform offers a couple of the capabilities 
there are like built-in workflow technologies into products, so the users can uh, use some kind of like domain-specific workflow technologies, or they can use something more generic. And this is actually biggest strength of Airflow that this is de facto standard for orchestration across the whole industry. So people might start using some built-in orchestration technologies, or maybe sometimes more proprietary one. But at certain point in time, they they need to have exit strategy and they really love Airflow. There is, in my opinion, nothing uh, better than Airflow at this point. Okay, that's, this is really cool to hear that you are gathering all the data and uh, talking to all the users, and it would be great, and Balkan mentioned that yesterday at, the, at his talk, uh, to, that you share more of that information with the community so that we also, as maintainers, know how to, uh, what to build and which, which things are used uh, more, most. Um, but let me start with uh, kind of going a little bit in the past. Uh, what was the uh, what was the biggest struggle that the users had uh, with Airflow uh, that you experienced? Uh, what, what what was the one one of the biggest problems that you can mention uh, and explain what the user had? Maybe John. Yeah, I, I can start with that. So I, I think one of the often the, the challenges I hear from from Airflow users is just writing good code, right? Just write, you know, writing the die code. You can do anything you want with Airflow. And the problem with that is you can do anything you want with Airflow. And so, you know, there's, there's very few guide rails. And in fact, I know there was a few, I think there was a few talks by some uh, use cases this week where the solution was to essentially create a DAG factory or abstract the DAG code so you don't, have, don't trust your users to write code at all. Uh, and, you know, I have a talk later on today where I'm talking about how little changes to your DAG code can cost you a lot of extra money, and that's a big concern for, for organizations, right? You know, you need to be able to reduce costs. One way is to say you can't do this, right? And the other way is to say, um, you know, you're only, you know, or, or say, well, you have to learn all this sort of stuff in the background. And that's something I think users struggle with a lot. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So it goes two ways. I think for a lot of data engineers, they struggle when they do have to do something that isn't their job. Um, so if you're a data engineer and you have to go write some Terraform or manage infrastructure, that's not going to be a fun process. Uh, so on one hand, like if I'm using Airflow to do data engineering and have to do stuff that isn't data engineering, that's not going to be fun. Um, on the other hand, John, I actually agree with your answer a lot, right? Like Airflow has a lot of, I like to call it like no batteries included, but also like no guardrails. So a lot of times people struggle with like, what's the right way to do something? Um, you know, I think a really specific example of this was like before dynamic task mapping was released, a lot of people implemented all sorts of patterns to do things around runtime conditions, right? I want to go to this S3 bucket, read all the files in there and generate a task for file and the number of files in the S3 bucket can change every day. For those sorts of things, I think people struggled a lot, and then having to maintain that afterwards was also not fun. Um, and I think that one thing that's been really great to see over time is just the Airflow community coalescing on more and more best practices to make it so that people have confidence whether or not they're doing the right thing or not. Yeah. So to, to add on top of the things that were already mentioned, uh, I don't know whether, whether it is... It, is from the past, uh, maybe it is still ongoing, but uh, people really struggle with uh, configuring Airflow environments and Airflow parameters to, to get the best out of the Airflow environment. We have a lot of Airflow parameters, which uh, brings a lot of like power to uh, powerful Airflow users, but uh, those who start their journey with Airflow actually struggle a lot. Um, so, so this is one thing. Kind of some kind of uh, like uh, help in this area would would really make those uh, make the lives of those people uh, easier. And in general, I think that as a community we could start thinking how to make our flow more powerful. Like people are interested in running millions of ducks and uh, tasks, uh, and I, I don't think that you know. This airflow without batteries uh, <laughs> from from uh, from the shelf uh, helps with this effort. Yeah, you need to have a little bit like PhD in airflow to to to, to get to the point where you can uh, run workflows at scale. So before you go, Yark, I actually have another question for the three of you. I'm curious to get your opinion on um, from the users that you've talked to. Have you have they said that airflow is hard to learn? Like data engineers, have they kind of said that getting started with the airflow is difficult for them? During this conference or outside of this conference? Outside of this conference. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to be frank, yes. 
like a lot of people say that airflow is difficult. Uh, it, this is a lot of, there is a lot of fun in learning, uh, le learning things in airflow and they really enjoy it. Uh, but, uh, for example, people who manage teams uh, uh, who use this technology in-house in, in, uh, in companies, they have a struggle. Like, for example, one person who is an expert over in Airflow, they change jobs. Now they are left with complex Airflow infrastructure and someone needs to relearn re how to run it. And, and I, that's, I 100% agree. And, and the only nuance I would add to that is basically, I, I think that from what I hear, Airflow is very, you know, the customer users basically say, Airflow is easy to use. It's hard to use well, right? If you're going to run it, if you're, you, it is so easy to write a, a, a DAG, you know, some basic Python knowledge, you're off to the races. The problem is when you want that DAG to run every minute of every day for the, you know, year round. And that scale is where the, even the small problems become big problems. And that's where, you know, it gets to a certain point where, it, it, hey, this, this worked when I, when I ran it in my dev system. And then when I go ahead and try and use it in production, why, why is nothing working? And, and that's, that's the challenge. It's almost, it, because it is so easy to get in, sometimes it gives a, a false sense of security that, okay, great, I can just scale this up infinitely. Yeah, users have, have this dream of like implementing once and running forever. Like I implemented a DAC two years ago. I want this DAC to run for the next three years. This is what people want. And to add, to add from my side, the questions I got from, from users sometimes, uh, uh, yeah, the basic things are very simple in, in Airflow, but when you go and try to see, like, for example, what kind of, uh, the, which, which parts of the DAG are executed during parsing, that's a very often, often question that we, what, that we hear. And it's difficult to explain, difficult to, uh, uh, for 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 several for people who don't know how Python parsing works, it's difficult for them to understand. But there are some ways you can make we can make it simpler, and I I, I hope we can uh, together work on in the future to make it make it simpler. Um, one question I have, and that's that's very um, I'm I'm very cur curious about that one. Uh, when we're, whenever we deliver new features, uh, we don't know how useful they will be, how people will be excited, how people will be uh, using them, uh, whether they will be popular or not. So from your past experience, what was the single feature that we released in Airflow uh, and that got the users of yours excited? If you, do you know, do you have some example of, especially I'm interested in such a feature, such a feature that we never expected to be, you know, hugely popular or huge people getting get excited about that. Can, can we extend to three items or something? <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, maybe not feature, but for example, Airflow 2 was a big splash, like uh, uh, with uh, the REST, uh, stable REST API and uh, schedule HA, this was like a dream of many users. So big, big thank you for this. Uh, async tasks and trigger. Um, and and uh, the, the the thing that it comes into like in, in conversations is op open lineage and support in general for for lineage. Yeah, I think like uh, <laughs> you know that's one of those questions that like the data shows the answer to really well. So it's like when you ship a feature, you look at the usage dashboard. Like what looks like this? What is everyone adopting immediately? And uh, in my experience. Far and away, that was multiple schedulers. I think as soon as people got into Airflow 2, almost the first thing they would do is say, all right, I'm going to have three schedulers or two schedulers or so on and so forth. Um, and that's always really exciting, right? When you ship something that the users want immediately, right? They're trying to claw it out of your hands. Um, I think the other big one was dynamic task mapping. And I think what I underestimated was how much more stable dynamic task mapping made a lot of Airflow's users' lives. Um, I would see all sorts of weird things around like, hey, this DAG is generate these nine other DAGs that make up for dynamic task mapping uh, because you know, some company had to deliver files to a regulator at the end of every day and they needed to make sure that ran all the time, every time. Um, so they would do some intricate stuff with Airflow that would make it so it could parse those runtime conditions. Um, that would make things very hard to maintain and then dynamic task mapping came around and it didn't get as many users as high availability scheduling, but the ones that did use it 
really needed that feature and it made all their other DAGs run better because it made it so they stopped doing weird things inside of Airflow. Yeah, dynamic task mapping is really cool. In fact, you know, a bit of a spoiler from my session this afternoon on reducing costs is dynamic task mapping actually is more efficient by a fair margin. Um, so that's that was a great one. Multiple schedulers for sure. Just the stability of running something at, at scale. If a scheduler has a problem, the rest of them pick it up. It was, you know, high availability from the start was great. Um, you know, deferrable operators, you know, asynchronous that you mentioned is, has been a, bit, a, a real big interest. Again, as a cost savings, um, you know, when you look at, uh, I think from last year's Airflow survey, 25% of Airflow users said they had 100 or more tasks in their DAGs. So if you're running that many tasks, you obviously get a lot of benefit, and the scale's only going up from there. People are, it's not uncommon for people to have thousands of tasks in a day. Um, it's amazing it works, but it absolutely does. And so, um, you know, tools like that, and tools to make a, um, the, the tasks run more efficient are a are, are big deal. Okay. I'm really happy to hear that the new things that we were working on, the, the whole community and maintainers, that, the, that they are so, so used. Thanks, thanks Rafa, for, for, for this. Um, going from the past to the, to the, to the present, uh, what, is the, what are the things that the users are asking you right now that they miss and they would like to have uh, in, in Airflow? Period. Yeah, I can start with that one. Um, so I think I'm going to say two things again. Like number one is machine learning. How do I do machine learning in Airflow? What are the best practices? What are the patterns I need to follow? Um, our board's yelling at us for LLMs. How do we do this with Airflow? So I think that independent of that whole hype cycle, a lot of people are at the point where they've been using Airflow for years. Their data engineering team bought it in. Um, and now they're looking to expand use cases, and those use cases just happen to be any sort of predictive analytics, right? Chatbots are one subset of that, but even other things around like, what's my product's usage gonna be? How do I project out lifetime value of a customer? Um, those sorts of machine learning use cases, you really do need that foundation of data engineering work to be done before you can go about those. And data engineers have very common patterns that can end up there, right? Even going all the way back to like Kimball and star schemas and so on and so forth. Um, there isn't that same set of patterns for ML ops. Um, and I think like uh, some of the other talks mentioned this, but that space is very fragmented, both in terms of vendors out there, but also in terms of patterns people use. So I think users really want guidance around how to do ML ops um, and features that come from there. And I think that ties into this bigger narrative, right? Where I think a lot of what users want is just some more information about how different Airflow features can be used with one another. Um, I went to a talk yesterday by, I think their name was Madison, and uh, they went through kind of like, here's how you use something in Airflow now, here's how it used to be. And I thought that was a really cool talk, and I think we should extend that to be like, um, Rafa, like what you're saying is, a user writes a DAG, and they expect it to run for the next three years. Well, the thing is, there's a lot of things you can do to that DAG now that make it run better that you couldn't do before. So some sort of, um, I guess like deeper sort of information that ties together how Tassel API fits with data-centric scheduling, it fits with setup and teardown tasks. So you know what like a modern Airflow DAG looks like and how much that's beneficial compared to what Airflow DAGs used to look like. Um, I think I've seen a lot of users ask for that. You know, for, from the users I've spoken to by, you know, hands down the biggest thing that's, that, that is coming is uh, multi-tenancy is really the thing they want. Um, you, know, um, you know, from, again, going back to last year's Airflow survey, 33% of organizations have more than 50 Airflow users, but only 9% have more than 20 Airflow clusters, which means, by definition, there's a bunch of people sharing these things. And if you're a financial institution, like there's, I think there's several represented here today, you often need data isolation. Like if, if, you know, Alice has a DAG that runs once a day that talks to one data set and Bob has a task that, uh, by the way, if there's an Alice and a Bob from a bank here, was it totally an accident. And Bob, and Bob has a second DAG that runs once a day that talks to a different data set. Most of these organizations, they're not allowed to see each other's data at all, right? They can't, they can't see how they're manipulating it. They can't do that. So. You know, right now their only answer is, well, Alice gets her own uh, cluster and Bob gets his own cluster to run like one task a day, which makes no sense from an operational standpoint. And that's where they're going to look for other tasks or other other ways to do, to handle that scheduling. Whereas if it was truly multi-tenant, where it says that 
I can say that Alice gets these connections, and these are her DAGs, and this is what it runs, and this is the, her logs, and, and Bob's got their own, his own, and they can't see each other. Now all of a sudden, Aeroflow becomes a much better op uh, um, option because they can offer that level of isolation without having when still meet all of the compliance requirements they have. Yeah, I definitely like second what John said, like multi-tenancy and better security model. People want to have the possibility to define permissions on the per duck level and per user level, like they, they need it. And literally they, they want to have the possibility to, to say, okay, this user runs only this duck, nothing more. He, they cannot see anything else. So, so this is one thing, better performance, like uh, more, usually users, at least in case of Cloud Composer, they start with some uh, size of the uh, airflow environment and with time going, they are adding more and more uh, DACs uh, and they expect the environment is going to like perform well. Uh, so the, the better performance of airflow, uh, the, 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 the better situation for them. Also some kind of predictive analytics uh, like uh, um, that is going to deliver some information to the user. Your, for example, inter-task latency is growing. Maybe you should think about, uh, for example, increasing the, the resources for some of the components. Uh, and the third thing I would say is some kind of auto-configuration wizard that helps users to tune parameters of airflow environments because people are really struggling. Okay, cool. So, some cool ideas for uh, new AIPs and new uh, uh, new PRs here. Uh, going to the future a little, uh, about the orchestration itself. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, to, to, today, today during the, the previous talks, we were talking about like orchestration is central for everything, including the ML, new ML uh, uh, flows uh, and this reference implementation that uh, that the astronomer guys mentioned, uh, Airflow is in the center of it. Do you think this is the orchestration piece uh, is gonna change in the future, uh, change its function, like be more, do more for the users or less of like it will be more magical and do do stuff for the users uh, more than than, than currently uh, Airflow is doing. What do you think about? future of orchestration in this context? Uh, I, I think that people really count on using generative AI to, to help them with orchestration. Uh, they want to use natural language actually to express their needs and uh, somehow automatically the workflow should be created uh, for, for, for them. I, I think that they really, they, they really would like to, to, to have it. Uh, it. It is also somehow connected with DAC authoring uh, with the help of uh, GenAI. Uh, models. So, if I just need to mention one thing, I would just vote for it. Yeah. So, like AI hype aside, I think we're already living in a world where people are trying to do more with orchestration. A lot of the folks I've talked to today and kind of over the last X years have said, yeah, my data engineering team uses Airflow, but I want to make it so my analysts that only know SQL can orchestrate their DAGs or orchestrate their workloads. Um, and I think when you look at what some of the other tools in the ecosystem are doing, uh, they're all launching orchestration features within their tool. So like Databricks has a workflows thing, Snowflake has their tasks. Um, I know Amazon has like six other schedulers in there between different services. So I think we're already living in a world where people are trying to extend out orchestration capabilities. I think what we can really do as an Airflow community uh, to make it so that we stay front and center there is to just listen to what those users want and figure out how to stay standardized, but also innovative in that space, right? Like, how should a data analyst use Airflow? Is that something that Airflow should have batteries included for, or is that something that we should tell the data platform team to build themselves? Should that extension live within core Apache Airflow? Should that leave externally? Um, I'm not really sure what the answers to these are, but I think we're already living in a world where the need for orchestration is going up. And I think that as more tools have their own orchestration features, the more you're gonna need an orchestrator that sits above all of those, right? Because that complexity is only gonna increase. And you're never just gonna have one tool for everything, um, as nice as that would be. Um, everything around how language models and generative AI and so on and so forth, I think they're gonna try to, they're gonna be helping solve the same business problem that you have a lot of people in your organization that needs to put, that need to put workloads in production, they need data to be delivered on time every time. 
And I think these language models are just pieces of the solution to solving that bigger business problem. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. I think that I, I, I love the way you're saying the orchestrator of the orchestrators, right? Because really there are so many, if you're, you know, you have a bunch of these jobs that have to run in one system and a bunch of jobs have to run another system and maybe the people that are using those other systems don't use Airflow and vice versa. Um, there's really an opportunity at both ends for, for Airflow. There's the opportunity of the sort of automagical type thing where it's literally like, I just need to get the data from there to there and I don't care what happens between it. I just want to just, just move it. I don't care, figure it out. Right, and so there's that part of it. And then there's also the part for the more folks that need a very bespoke solution, very tailored, and, and tools like dynamic task mapping really address those where you can say, well, I need to provide a very tailored solution. I need that sort of capability in Airflow, but I need Airflow to make it so I don't have to constantly deal with all the boilerplate and the overhead. I just want to provide a very, set, I've got a, a set of information, I want to pass it to another thing, and it just does it. So I'm going to agree with half that answer and disagree with the other half. <laughs> well, I did offer both ends, so that means the odds are you're going to have to disagree at least one. Yeah. So I completely agree this idea of like orchestrative orchestrators. There's legs behind that. Um, I said earlier Julian's a cheat code on our team. So two things that uh, him and his team have made have been like a more first class way to run dbt that actually decomposes the dbt DAG into the Airflow UI. And they also made something around that for Databricks, for Databricks Workflows product. So I completely agree at that point. I think the point that I might maybe not disagree with, but I guess I have like a sub bullet to, is even in this world where you have a gen AI that says, hey, I need data from here to there, I don't care how that happens, and it generates a DAG and you're good and happy, I think that will probably happen, but I think that'll actually make it so Airflow is more important because like from what I've seen with moving data and data engineering, like whatever can go wrong will go wrong. And when you put something into production once and that's running, it's only a matter of time before that fails and you need to trace back what happened and what you need to fix and so on and so forth. So I think this like automagical DAG authoring experience will actually make it so that you need an orchestrator of orchestrators more, not less, because you'll have more data moving around. That'll make it so you have to debug more things, you'll have to make sure more pipelines run on time, you'll need lineage between those things. Um, so it's like, uh, it's only going to add to the, add to the airflow momentum. Yeah, I was less thinking about sort of uh, AI-generated DAGs and more thinking about opinionated solutions, right? More about where we're, Airflow is not opinionated about anything by design, right? Airflow is like, you can do it however you want, no problem, enjoy. We've got a thousand different operators you can choose from. And no, I'm not necessarily agreeing with Bolka's presentation, but I'm still saying you've got a thousand operators to choose from. But we don't offer any opinions on that. And so, you know, the idea that, you know, there's a opinionated solution to say, if you need to go from this type of data to that type of data, you don't have to know the things that have to be done in that. We've, that solution's already been generated and we just know because somebody who knows really well has come up with the specific DAG solution or whatever that connects those dots for you so you don't have to know. Yeah, but, but to, to be able to actually to get to the point where people are just expressing their intents without specifying any technological pieces, like I use this operator to do this. So uh, Airflow would need to be kind of uh, um, plugged into the like broader platform. And uh, so the broader context needs to be passed to the, uh, to the ML model. Uh, so this ML model knows, okay, this user uses this service, this service, and this service, so I can orchestrate everything for this user using Airflow. So something like this will need to happen to, to broaden the scope. But even that's going to be like a balance, right? Because on one side, you want to take advantage of these magical technologies, um, but they are a black box for 99.99% of people. And one of the best things about Airflow, it's always been transparent, right? That's part of why people trust it, is you can kind of pop the hood open and see what's going on. It's the whole point of being open source. So I think there's gonna be a fine line to walk there, especially as you think about the day two operations of, the, of those pipelines that are magically created. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. Like, it cannot be like uh, the Gen AI thing proposes a DAG that no one is able to understand. It would be like a disaster. Like it needs to be eventually in the human readable format and people need to have this uh, um, uh, comfort that eventually they are going to be able to see the DAG, the code of it, they will understand it and they will be able to figure things out on their own. Although automatically you could think about like some functionality that basically takes care of it and do whatever it takes to actually run workloads when, successfully. I, I don't know whether it is utopian or not. Yeah. And when their boss yells at them for writing a DAG that costs $60,000 a day, you know, they need to be able to justify which, which is why I think you need less magic and more curated. 
Yes, right. especially, especially we might uh, experience something like the ML hallucinating about the DAX and having some completely, um, completely wrong, but well-looking DAX that do something completely that you didn't want, which happens with, uh, with, with current uh, AI, generative, generative AI. Uh, one last question before I uh, turn to the, to the audience uh, to ask question. Like what, the, what can the community do more to listen to the users and respond to their needs? What do you think like it's missing now or how, what, what can we improve as maintainers, as, uh, as the people who create Airflow? Well, I think one thing is just to, you know, encourage folks, we're already doing this and we need to do more of it, encourage folks to participate, right? Don't we, there's a little bit of a, a barrier for new users to like it's kind of scary to go in and I don't want to ask a dumb question because everyone's going to make fun of me or whatever it is and just understand how inclusive this community is and there really are no dumb questions and you really can and, and you know encourage uh, users to say go into the into the airflow slack ask a question you know there I, I don't know if there's a still newbie channel but you know like ask ask a question wherever it's appropriate someone will answer you Many someone's typically right, and and that way just encourage that that feedback that way, and 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 participate in the community. Open an issue, open a PO. You know, I mean, try to do a little PR if you see a problem. I mean, that that sort of stuff. The more people that we're already the largest number of contributors of any other Apache project, let's let's double that. That's the way we can hear more from them. I think that's a great point. I think. One very tangible thing is back when I got started with Airflow, I used to be able to just run pip install Apache Airflow and I was up and running in like five minutes. Getting started with Airflow today is not that easy. Um, there's some wrappers around Docker and so on and so, so forth that exist, but then you have to like learn Docker and blah, blah, blah. So I think we can kind of lower the barrier to entry just based off of that. Um, I think post that, um, there's just a lot of room for users to talk to each other. I think Airflow especially has this line between, hey, I am in Airflow, maybe I commit to Airflow, I write hooks and operators, and another set of users that will never do that, but they're incredible DAG writers, and they write DAGs that um, really power businesses. And I think anything we can do to make it so those users talk to each other more, um, and that includes things like in-person meetups, in-person summits, virtual meetups, virtual summits, more curated discussions, I think that would go a long way. Uh, maybe maybe last thing uh, from me. So, uh, for example, when I'm seeing the the, the, the users using a Composer, like they implemented something two two years ago, and they want uh, those things to uh, keep and running uh, in the healthy way. I think that they don't like backward incompatible changes, so we need to be kind of careful what kind of changes we are introducing between the minor versions of Airflow. Because for many people. For Airflow enthusiasts, uh, it's actually perfect. I'm going to use the newest feature in Airflow. Wow. Uh, but for them, sometimes it means, for example, changing, for example, 5,000 DAGs. Someone else implemented those DAGs, and now I need to change it. So maybe this is something that we can think in the near future. OK, thanks. Thanks a lot. So we, it means that we need more meetups, more uh, airflow summits in various places in the world, probably because this is uh, this is something that I, I hear that it helps. Uh, so now I'm turning to the to the audience. Uh, anyone has a question for uh, there? There you go. Hey, thanks. thanks for the great uh, panel and for the presentations before. I had actually a question related to one of the previous presentations regarding using uh, using Airflow for the uh, large language large language model ops, what are your, what's your take on the future of kind of you leveraging Airflow for MLOps in general and some of the intricacies regarding that like event, like uh, uh, experiment management, model metadata and things of that sort? Yeah, I can take this one. So I think a lot of times people put machine learning pipelines into production with Airflow right now. And sometimes, like we show, they're powering a chatbot. Other times, they might be powering website recommendations and so on and so forth. So I think that future is already here. Um, I think we can do some more to help it make it so that Airflow can be used to better monitor those pipelines. And there's probably some visibility between users, uh, some bit more visibility we can give to users. Um, I think there's a whole other bucket of things to say, like, where in the machine learning life cycle should Airflow really focus on? Should it focus on helping you run experiments? Should it focus on just being the place to put 
uh, models into production, and so on and so forth. My personal take is more the second one. I think data scientists are always going to want to experiment in Jupyter notebooks, and you don't really want to rip those away. Um, but um, my personal take is, as Airflow becomes more machine learning friendly, it'll really be towards things needed to get models into production. So passing data back and forth, making it so that you get the visibility you need, and so on and so forth. Raj, just to follow on that, do you, is there a concern that the folks that write data models aren't necessarily data engineers mm -hmm. in, the, in the Airflow sense? And they're going to start using Airflow for doing that because Airflow is awesome and why wouldn't you? Um, but they may not be all that good at writing DAGs. And is there a concern that, you know, in the previous keynote saying, like, you know, if you all of a sudden launch a half million dollars worth of models because, you know, you accidentally put the wrong, in the wrong conditions in your DAG, what, what can Airflow do better to put the guardrails on for that so that those users don't run into those challenges? I think I see that less as guardrails and more around, like, transparency. Uh, so one example I think would be like the Taskflow API. I know a lot of data scientists and machine learning engineers started using Airflow because of the Taskflow API because it made sense to them. And I think that made it so you didn't need as many guardrails for those users because they just knew how to handle this, right? They could kind of intuitively see what this did. So maybe it's less about giving guardrails and more about creating interfaces that feel more native to these other personas. So, so one thing about uh, this running those uh, ML-related uh, workloads uh, is, so Airflow is, uh, by definition, an orchestration tool. Uh, you know, when it comes to um, like training um, LLM models and so on, we have uh, some kind of uh, another factor related to compute. So we are now mixing orchestration with compute. I'm not sure whether right now Airflow is... Uh, super prepared for this kind of uh, uh, workloads, especially taking into account that this compute part it will be very like big. So to, 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 to make sure that Airflow is going to meet the needs of uh, those uh, MLOps uh, um, uh, engineers, uh, we just need to maybe take a look whether we are actually able to train uh, open source LLM models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually a great callback to the panel yesterday when, when I, I think Garrick and Kaxla have very different opinions on whether you should be running compute on, uh, on the airflow workers or not. You know, we're, not, we're not terribly opinionated on that particular point. Well, individually we are. I think as a community we're not. Um, and uh, I mean, I think, again, proper guidance and just say, here, here's, here's, our, here's the airflow way to run your, your uh, ML models and just give people, you know, you can do something else, but here's the one we know works. Yeah, I think that what we could do as a community is we could provide those uh, patterns for the users to, to, to follow if they kind of want to like deviate and introduce something specific from them, that's okay. But by the way, coming to the uh, computer orchestration, uh, we might have our own opinions and the way people are using both compute and orchestration with Airflow. So. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yep, uh, so I had kind of like a suggestion in terms of um, uh, making Airflow like, easier for users. So for example, like um, Azure Databricks, so like if you want to work with it, uh, so you just need to like use the Azure Active Directory to like kind of like just sign in. So you didn't need to sign in into Azure, um, Active, so you didn't need to sign in into Azure Databricks. So it, automa so it automatically just sign in via like Azure AD. So, there are, so I wanted to ask that like um, kind of like making Airflow like easier. For example, like if you want to like migrate like um, kind of like SQL from like SQL Server, so like Azure SQL database, like isn't there a way to like just instead of like using like kind of like the con ID, you can just like I don't know like just like directly connect just like Azure as, Azure AD, so like user just like st maybe just clicks for like Azure AD, so like clicks for the SQL Server, then like also for the um, Azure SQL database. It's kind of like instead of like like searching for like um like what is the ID for like um my SQL con ID, or like maybe like Azure um like Azure SQL database, so like lots of like inputs. The user can just like, like just makes things very, very easy for the users. Yep. Yeah, I think anything that we can do to make connection management easier would go a long way, right? Once you get Airflow running, the first thing you have to do is connect to a database, and that can be non-trivial, especially as you deal with different types of connection strings and so on and so forth. So I, I totally agree with that. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, so the question is around like some of the trends we've seen in orchestration. So. It seems like a, a big theme is around more constraints and more guarantees, especially around 
data awareness, like the whole idea of, um, say, applying schemas to the jobs and the orchestrator being, you know, very kind of lineage aware or schema aware. That's a trend. At the same time, like Airflow was designed with very much like separation and concerns in mind, just like just run my job. You don't need to know what it is. But so curious on how users in the community feel about that. You know, if they want it, they don't want it, some want it. Progressive uh, adoptability maybe of some of these features. So how are you all thinking about that? I'll take a stab at it and then I'll hand it over to, to the rest of the panel. I mean, I think in general, users want better observability. I don't think they know what that is yet. I don't think they know whether it's open lineage or, um, or telemetry or, I mean, they know they don't like the idea that something didn't work and they can't, they can't figure out why. That's, that's well, clearly anyone to that. But I'm not sure anyone's really settled on, here's the experience I want to have to do that. I mean, there's some cool stuff. I watched the presentation on open telemetry yesterday. It's got some wonderful potential showing you like the actual, here's this thing ran for this long and then this thing happened and then this thing happened. That's super cool. But I don't think anyone's landed on, okay, here, here's the experience I really want and, and, and be able to deliver that. But I'd love to hear what you folks think. Yeah. First off, holy imposter syndrome. Max is asking me a question at Airflow Summit. <laughs> it's going to take a minute to take that in. <laughs> um, I think I largely agree with you. I think net net, I think what people want to see are abstractions for these things that are optional to use, right? Like take data sets, for example. Right now, data sets in Airflow are pretty bare bones, right? It's like, hey, you can define a data set, you can do some things with it. I think people would want the option to add things like schemas or guarantees or some notion of data contracts to that. Um, I don't know what the right way to implement those, were, those are or what exact things we should put in there, but I think users want options to add those things. Um, and then some will use it and some will don't. Um, I think that for a lot of folks that run a lot of their workloads in the cloud and cloud natively, uh, like everything's on Snowflake or Databricks, I think there's more demand from that subset of users for that. Um, I'm not sure if folks who are still really on-prem with Hive and EMR, Hive, not EMR, it's not on-prem, Hive and other things in a data center are as hungry for kind of defining schemas within Airflow. Yeah. Data observability, as you mentioned, of course, it's super important. And the, the other thing that Max mentioned, uh, like guarantees, I want this duck to run today and I want to be informed that it didn't, didn't run and what was the, the root cause. Because people are actually running critical business processes uh, uh, with Airflow and there is a real problem if the duck didn't finish on time and didn't produce the actual results. Sometimes people are offering service, so they are building platforms on Airflow and they are offering services to other um, other customers and there is a huge problem if the duck didn't, didn't run and they didn't fulfill the contract. The, so. I would say the guarantees is also very important, uh, SLAs. Yeah, I was, I'm glad you brought up SLAs because I think there is some work underway, right, to improve some of the, the way the SLAs work on, in, in Airflow, I think. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's part of it. I think what we hear, too, is that Airflow's built all those constructs like SLAs and things like that, and mm -hmm. it's being improved and worked on. But once again, we kind of leave it up to folks to decide if they want to use it or not, right? And if they do, we don't tell them how exactly. Like this is the way you this is the way you guarantee DAGs to run, right? This is the this is again. I'll go back to it, the airflow way of making sure that your DAGs ran that day. Um, and you know what I often see from users is they may be aware of that capability, they may not, but they didn't use it, and we didn't. It's not out of the box running that way, uh, and so. They just don't. It's not that the observability tools don't exist, and it's not that you can't plug in open lineage, it's not that you can't create an alarm on one of the, the metrics from StatsD. You can totally do that. You can run an SLA that sends a Slack message to the entire company that, hey, the DAG didn't run today. Um, but people just aren't doing it. And I don't know, I don't have a good answer as to how we can lead that particular horse to water. Mm -hmm. okay. People want the guarantees, but they don't want the constraints. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. How, how much do we want to shove them in the right direction? How close to the water are we going to lead them? Or are we going to actually make them drink? But may maybe it's a good thing to be a little bit opinionated and we can say, by default, this is how it works. Please use it. If you don't like it, tune it. 
Because as you don't said, people many times don't know what they need actually. They so, want something, but... Uh, or, or what happens is they didn't know they needed it until that, that critical data job you know, missed the end of quarter report and all of a sudden they're in front of the CEO trying to explain what the heck went wrong. Phil, right. Phil starts the, 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 the job that we've done with activity view, uh, cluster monitoring uh, in Airflow 2.7 is just the beginning of, of what we are talking about. Yeah. Any more questions? Hello. Hi. Oh, can I? Um, uh, right, I'm right here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my right. So we've been talking a lot about AI ML. Um, the, at Etsy, the star of the show is not Airflow, it's, it's Vertex, it's Dataproc, it's EMR, it's SageMaker. You know, we, we don't do compute on Airflow. Um, we, we, we've had problems where, like during blue-green deploys on our GKE cluster, uh, you know, a 24-hour job will, will uh, get disconnected and Airflow will retry it naturally. So much, so many problems in this vein that like we've, we've added re reattaching logic so that these 24-hour jobs We'll, we'll do list calls to Vertex, we'll do list calls to Dataproc and see that they're, that they're still running, reattached to them. I'm just wondering, for, for Google and Amazon <clears throat> specifically, like when Vlada is, is working on Google providers, how close are you to, to Vertex? How close are you to Dataproc and discussing like what's going on and hey, we're gonna orchestrate jobs this way and, and this, is where, uh, this is how things are gonna work? Yeah, so, so in case of such long workloads, like many, many hours, uh, definitely our recommendation for the, for the user is, is don't run this compute on, uh, for example, GKE cluster, because GKE cluster, by definition, uh, assumes that the workload is, is almost like uh, you can restart it. It's kind of stateless. Uh, there is some persistence, and you can like uh, re-read the data from the persistent uh, disk. Uh, uh, so in... But coming back to, to your question related to like using other services like Vertex AI, uh, it's a matter of implementing uh, proper logic in operators. So the, the, you are reattaching, you are checking whether the, the job that you started is still running and you are reattaching re uh, to it. I think that in big query operators, we have uh, certain things. Maybe we just need to review all the operators and improve the quality of, the, of, of them. Uh, uh, no, 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 don't think about it uh, in, in this way. We do, because uh, customers actually, when it comes to support cases, they will come to us and they will say, come on, I'm running this, I, I run the job, I lost 200 bucks, now what? And we need to help the customer. Uh, sometimes we need to uh, give some GCP credits if we come to a conclusion, okay, this was our mistake. Mm. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you guys for uh, sharing your experiences with the, with the users. Thanks a lot for being part of it. Uh, big clap, big clap. <laughs> <laughs>